Hi, I'm Brian Tima, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. Our prayer is that God use this as an incredible resource to align your heart with His. We know that you're not always able to plug into a local church, but we highly encourage that. Yet we are grateful to be able to offer this resource to you. And if you find that you've been ministered greatly by something that the Ministry of Grace Spring has been doing, feel free to check out our website in ways that you might be able to serve or give. Now let's prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Well, good morning. Morning, Gracebrook family. Uh, Happy New Year. Um, My name is Eric Kuhn. I am our groups director here at Grace Spring. I have the absolute privilege of working with our GS Life team and our staff here and uh, just so glad uh, to be a part of what the Lord's doing here among this church family. If you are new with us this morning, we're especially uh, grateful that you're with us. There's a card that looks like this in the chair in front of you. Uh, We'd love to have you fill that out and just get to know you a little bit better. We will not spam you with a whole bunch of email or anything like that. Um, But we we would just love to know that you're here. And uh, we're we're just super honored that you would spend some time with us uh, this Sunday morning. So that is that. that. Also, uh, there's a card like this that uh, looks like this that's right there as well. This is our prayer card. We have a team of people every week that pray for these prayer needs. So if you have a prayer need, it, may be, it might seem really small. It might, be, it might seem really big. Uh, either way, we would love to have you fill this prayer card out and you can put it in one of the boxes um, at the back or bring it up to service af- at the end. I would love to uh, pray over those things. Um, also, if you're, if you're newer, if you have questions, there's a hub out in the concourse that is always a great place to stop and ask questions. There's a team of people out there that would love to talk with you and answer any questions that you might have. Um, well, I have been tasked this week with uh, letting you know about something that's coming up next Sunday, which is our group Sunday. And you might be asking, well, what is that? Uh, a couple times a year um, in September and then now we have a group Sunday. Uh, In September, we had a huge party. For those of you who were here, you might remember we had tables all over the concourse with prizes we were giving out and and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, This next Sunday, we're not doing that, but we will have a couple tables set out by the ministry counter. I will be out there next Sunday with a few friends uh, from our women's Bible studies that you can sign up for that. Our Colossian Way, which is a class you'll hear more about later in the service. Um, And then also a couple offerings from our Response Care Center. And so I'd love to have you come out there next Sunday and talk with one of us. Um, But we believe that every person here uh, has an invitation from the Lord to find their people. And, And that Christianity is not a solo endeavor that it is something that we are called to walk alongside others uh, because we just can't do life alone. And uh, we need others, right? We need others in our lives to come alongside us and for us to come alongside them. And so that is why we provide groups for every age and stage of life. And, uh, and so the, the final thing I, I want to tell you is that next Sunday also, we are having a new platform uh, for finding groups at Grace Spring. So if you go on our groups page next Sunday, there'll be a group finder tab that will take you to a new site that is clean and easy for you to look at groups, common interest groups like adventure, outdoor adventure hiking, uh, connect groups like our seasoned sisters or empty nesters, and then life groups. So those are small groups that are uh, going on throughout the church at various places and times. Uh, So with that, that is all I have for you this morning, but um, we're going to be singing this morning, and uh, I want to just sing a little song for you as we start. It's beginning to look a lot like Chris. I know, it's two weeks too late, but you know, it's, it's still, my kids are thrilled uh, to go sledding today, even if there's just this much snow. So, uh, but all that to say, would you stand with us as we worship our King and our Lord Jesus this morning? Uh, we're going to sing praises to his name. Good morning, church. This comes from Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my 
thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord.
prayer with me. I know it's an oldie, but I think it's a goodie. If you uh, are familiar with it, just sing out. If not, just allow these words, hopefully, to penetrate your heart. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to God, that's our prayer. Lord, as we open up your word, Father, I just pray that that how we receive the authority of your word will be taken deep in the recesses of our soul because you are in the job of transforming from the inside out. 
starting with our heart, starting with our soul. And so, Father, this new year, Lord, just take, take a hold of our heart. I pray that on behalf of just this church family. Take a hold of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you're being seated, could you just meet those that are around you before we get, get into God's Word? Good morning, buddy. Good morning. All right, everybody. Here we go. Well, Happy New Year. How was your first week of the new year? Yeah, good. Well, are you excited about getting into the book of Genesis? Yes, I tell you, I think it's going to be a hugely important study, I think, for our time. Because uh, the book of Genesis 2 really... uh, Uh, clear purposes from it. One is that through it, we learn of God's relationship with mankind, which is, I think, hugely important. That's where you and I fit into everything. But then also God's intention for all things. In fact, the book's name is Genesis. We get that in the English from the Greek word, uh, Genesis. And when the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek in 250 BC, yes, this first book, uh, Books were often named by kind of the the first word of that particular book, and this one was Genesis, meaning beginnings, meaning origins. And so I hope that you are looking forward to this. I think it's a hugely important um, book for us. I was asked by one of our staff members this week, hey, Brian, what is your hope for Genesis for our church family? And I go, my hope would be as we open up God's word together, my hope would be that we would really grow to become worshipers. I don't mean better singers. I mean better worshipers where we just allow the love of God in our hearts to really transform every area of our lives. And I think that will happen when we truly see the authority of God's word for what it is. And so we're going to be investigating that here this particular year. But my question is, why Genesis? Why Genesis? I mean, this is a year in one book of the Bible. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands of, man, that's going to be a long time. How many of you think that's too long? No, I'm not going to do that. Um... I'm just going to say why we do this periodically here at Grace Spring Bible Church is for us to do good exegesis. And what that means is it is taking the time to take bite-sized chunks to see the context, what was being written, who was the author, who was the audience, Um, Because oftentimes we as English readers will take things and, and read scripture through the lenses of our Western culture. And I think exegesis helps prevent us from doing that. Exegesis really helps say, let's really do the hard work, the important work, so that we get accurate translation from doing the hard work of exegesis. What happens in many churches is what's called eisegesis, and that is a pastor will look for a passage of scripture that will say something that the pastor wants to say and uses scripture to reinforce everything that the pastor or communicator wants to say. This really guards from that because I will be forced to talk about things that are very difficult to talk about. I mean, we're going to be introduced to like the Nephilim. You go, who the heck are the Nephilim? Well, we are going to study who the Nephilim are in this journey. We are going to be introduced to Christophanes. You know what a Christophany is? Christophany is... Christ appearing on the scene before he was born in Bethlehem, all the way back in Genesis. We will see Christophanes. You'll go, wow, I didn't know that. Well, I tell you, this is why we do exegesis. We study, and it forces the communicator to do the hard work. And this is an important work for we as a church because beginnings are hugely important. Why Genesis speaks loudly to our time. 
Some people would say, well, you know, what would speak more to our time is do a study in Revelation. You know, the whole world's doing a study in Revelation. I really think for us to really be able to thrive in the day and age which we live, we've got to make sure that our lives are being built on the foundation of the authority of what is spoken of in Genesis. It's hugely important. If you see the the spiritual warfare happening, the enemy so much has has kind of undergirded foundational aspect and now we see so much taught in school and evolution and no the absence of an intelligent designer and it's just it's mind-boggling but uh, we'll talk about that here through the series but Genesis speaks loudly to our time talks loudly to all of the gender confusion that is happening in our world the redefining marriages that are happening in our world it's going to address all of that um, and and I think so very well also Genesis provides the answer of purpose and meaning in life now, I remember being a young kid. It wasn't that long ago. But I remember being a young kid. Actually, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> when I would wake up on January 1st and say, okay, has my life had purpose? I want to make sure I'm making decisions this year because I want to be true to my purpose. I want to be true to how God has designed me. And I think a lot of people have those questions. It's like, man, am I being true to who God has made me to be? And I think there's a lot of confusion out there. I, I, I brought this mallet here uh, from home because this was designed with a special purpose. No, not to be a weapon, but to drive in very difficult, very sturdy nails or stakes in the ground. Um, this has more weight behind it, and it could do more of an impact there than just your regular hammer. This was designed for a purpose. Could this crack open an egg? I, I mean, it could crack open an egg. But if I had a whole bunch of eggs here, and I went bam, 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 you guys would be... Like, what are you doing that for? Because this is not intended for something that delicate. But you see, we live in an age of incredible confusion. Would you agree with that? I mean, you don't have to look far in the news. In fact, you don't have to be a Christian or a Christ follower to have a sense of there is chaos and craziness going on in the world. But Genesis provides the answer for the purposes and meanings of life. Yesterday, I was working out, and I saw ESPN 30 for 30 um, on one of my favorite defensemen of all, or defensive NFL players of all time, Reggie White. I loved Reggie White. And the uh, 30 for 30 documentary was entitled The Ministry of Defense, because that guy was awesome on the football field. But what I loved about the documentary is he said time and time this statement. He said, no, my primary focus is I articulate and communicate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is my primary objective and purpose in life. I just happen to play football. And it was just so great to be able to see that documentary and to also see that once he retired from football, he had said this, that he had been preaching, he had been hired by a whole bunch of people to, hey, come speak at our event. And really, he said, what I was doing was only speaking what I had heard taught to me versus going into the text itself. And I, I really respect that with Reggie White and what he did. He got to learn Hebrew. He said, I want to learn in the original language so I can speak with authority versus, well, I'm just re-articulating what I heard a teacher that I respect say. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think it's really I think a good challenge for us to, if we are going to give answers to a world in need of answers, we got to have the conviction that we know that we know that we know of what the Lord says. Thirdly is this, Genesis is the foundation on which the rest of scripture is built. Genesis is the foundation from which the rest of scripture is built. I would contend this, that if you don't fully understand Genesis, that you will have a hard time understanding the rest of Scripture. 
So if you are here struggling with why would we spend a year in an Old Testament book? I mean, aren't we a New Testament church? Shouldn't we be focusing on the New Testament? And I would say everything that Genesis provides is foundational to our theological framework. And if your foundation is weak, everything built on that is very vulnerable. You guys are about ready to go and off into the working world, the college world. Man, I remember being in college. I remember being treated like an idiot for my views. And I remember taking the time to meet with the professors who thought I was an idiot for my views just to have a little bit of friendly banter. Because I found that they are far more people of faith than me, and we will discuss that here as this journey goes on. But if I were to summarize, summarize why Genesis, it would be this. Genesis describes what is broken in the world, how it got broken and stays broken, and God's plan to redeem the chaos. Oh, that's what I love about God. He is not intimidated by chaos. In fact, when he is invited into the chaos, he's got the authority, the power to do something about it. And I don't know, maybe you're in a chaotic season of life. Maybe life has gotten old, humdrum, whatever. Um, I do believe this is just such a great journey for you. And if I can encourage you, pick up a growth guide out there at the hub. Uh, I hope we still have enough for you because we were packed out for service and I think there was a swarm on the hub. So um, hopefully your growth guides can serve as a tool, as a supplemental tool to direct you to the Word of God so that you will get in the Word of God yourselves. Um, and I, I know in the past, like when we did the journey, Genesis through Revelation in a year, I knew of groups that said, hey, I'm going to have a group of ladies or a group of guys, and we're going to meet weekly, and we're going to listen, and we're going to wrestle with, and we're going to discuss um, some of uh, what was covered in the sermon or covered in the lesson or covered in the studying of God's word. And we've had people come to faith as a result of those kinds of meetings. So I want to invite you into the imagination, the gospel imagination of what God could do, not only in opening up your eyes, but maybe who in your sphere of influence might need you to invite in to this really, really important topic. So my pastoral encouragement for 2024 for you is read the book of Genesis as reading it for the very first time. Read through the book. You go, it's a big book, yes, but you can read through it, no problem. Um, as you were reading, I had a seminary prof, very famous seminary professor, so popular that his nickname was the prof, and he was the prof over guys like uh, Chuck Swindoll, Dr. David Jeremiah, all these great expositors of the word. And actually, it's these guys that prompted my heart to go and be trained at Dallas Theological Seminary. But when I was taking hermeneutics class, my very first class, hermeneutics, I'm trying to impress you with the long words I know, but I didn't know what hermeneutics meant until my first day of seminary when they go, well, it's hermeneutics class, it's the study of God's word. And the prof said this. He said, always read scripture as for the very first time because the great temptation is that you will read the scripture with the lenses that somebody has prescribed for you to read scriptures through. That could be your tradition. That could be a great Bible expositor. You go, okay, this is their view. So now I'm going to put on their glasses and I'm not always going to read and filter everything through these lenses. And what I appreciate about the prof, he said this, he reminded us that it's the Holy Spirit of God that Jesus said will train us, will teach us. Yes, God uses his servants, hopefully servants like me, to help you and inspire you to get deeper into the word of God. But I'm going to challenge us through this particular series that you might have read Genesis, you have opinions of Genesis, you know that you know that you know your position because you've gotten those from well-respected teachers. If I could challenge you, read Scripture as for the very first time and take note of what you might tend to skip over. 
I know for years there were statements I would skip over and say, that's just too hard to understand. But the beauty of God's revealed word, his special revelation given to us in the inspired word of God, the beauty of that is we have the opportunity to mine for it like we would mine for gold, that there's nuggets there. There's so many tools online you can use to study the original language to go deeper. So read the book of Genesis as reading for the very first time. If you are older and you feel like, hey, there's nothing new you could teach me that I have never uh, not heard before or something like that. Um, The prof also said this to people like you. If you say, well, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, he would say, well, that's true if you're teaching dogs and you're teaching tricks. But he says, you're never too old to learn new truths from the Word of God. And I do believe you will learn some stuff that's new. Come on Sunday, having read the text, we will study. That's in your growth guide, but just give you a heads up for next week. We're going to be studying Genesis chapter 1. Come early to our gatherings and pray that we get our focus right. It was so encouraging after first service to have a group say, we're going to start meeting early and we're going to pray over this place because the book of Genesis can be very divisive. Um, I've been talking to random people, those in the science community, those in, uh, uh, who've been around a gray spring for a while, and I know that in a society in which we live, a society which says, if you don't agree with me, then you're my enemy, um, no, this has got to be a place that you can listen, that you can be skeptical, that's okay, skeptics are welcome here, because I am just going to be pointing you to the authority of the Word of God. And so, um, and then also journal what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you along the way. I have found that I go back to past journals and past years, and I go, wow, man, I was really immature then. Man, I've really grown up. And if you recall three statements that you will hear with more frequency around here, that we encourage you to belong in real relationship, that you will belong in your relationship with Jesus Christ, but belong in relationship to one another's, um, to, our, to the one another's of Scripture, that we grow to be like Christ, that He transforms us from the inside out, not from the outside in. Religion tries to do that. It doesn't work. Inside out. Um, but then also that we cooperate and, and, and work with Christ in getting the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, reaching people where we live, work, and play. And so that all can be summed up in our mission of helping people take a step closer to Jesus. So you guys, that is kind of an overall setting the stage um, for where we're going. And I just, I hope you're encouraged. I hope you come with great anticipation. But I want you to turn in your Bible now to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We are going to do a deep dive in Genesis 1-1 today. Um, But I'm going to invite Paul Jennings up here to the stage. He's going to read the first two verses of Genesis. And uh, man, are you ready to get your toes wet? Are you ready? Fantastic. Well, good. I hope you are coming with great anticipation. So, Paul Jennings, you've been a part of this church family for a while, but tell us a little bit about yourself, buddy. Hi, Brian. Hey, Paul. I've been uh, attending with my wife and for about over 20 years. I can't pinpoint a date, but it's been about 20 years or more than 20 years, actually. Uh, we've raised four children here. Um, we have two grandchildren. It's just been a blessing to be a part of this family. It's just it's so okay. much fun. Um, been hanging around with teenagers for about 40 years, mm-hmm. uh, 28 years in public education, and then now 12 years in, uh, I'm a missionary at a nearby mission field. So it's been, it's Good. been so much fun. So Fantastic. anyway, thanks Paul. You bet. Please stand in the, for the reading of God's word. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. PJ, thank you so much. Yeah, wow, that was a lot. That's a lot to take in. (laughs) Now think about it. That is a lot to take in. Because I want you to look at your text. In the beginning. The question that people often get really tripped up on is, well, when was that? And this is why I say, unfortunately, and I I really mean this, I think unfortunately, science has felt like it's had to divorce itself from faith, Um, a lot of it because the enlightenment of the 17th century. Uh, The enlightenment of the 17th century started saying everything's got to have an explanation to it. But what I love about the scriptures is the mystery. Now, we've got to understand the audience Moses wrote this about 34 to 3,500 years ago. Moses wrote this. God gave him uh, really not a science book. I think it gets challenging when people look to the Bible as a science book. The Bible was not written to be a science book. In fact, the first two chapters contain 620 words. So this is 620 words on the origins of mankind, the origins of everything we see, heaven and earth, the origins of all that kind of stuff. But here's what uh, so fascinates me is that God, in his beautiful design, spoke the language of mathematics. How many of you like math? Man, okay. So you say, man, I can appreciate that God spoke the language of mathematics. How about biology? Any biologists out there? Yeah. Man, I love, you know, you might say, I love that God spoke the language of biology. I mean, we see this in such a beautiful, fascinating way. And what intrigues me, unfortunately, about science And because of how the church responded to some of the early conflicts between Darwinianism and everything, um, the tragedy is science reinforces faith like crazy. Would you agree with that? I mean, here's what is always a little bit humorous to me, and I'm just going to be honest with you, is that I will read an article, and it will be about a scientist making an amazing discovery. Like, for instance, if I could take you back in time, in 1903, there was a scientist by the name of Herbert Spencer, and he had studied and researched, and he concluded that for something to be knowable, it has to have had five aspects of it. Time, force, action, space, and matter. Now, he did a lot of research and concluded this in 1903, and people were like, man, that's so true. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, now, this is where it's participatory time. You get to shout out which word is appropriate for what, word I am saying. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Whoa! Wow! Doesn't that happen often? I mean, I'm always blown away in science where it's like, man, look, oh, the DNA strand. Look at how how cool this is and how it all makes sense. It's like, it's because we have a, a really sophisticated designer, okay? So with that, we need to be careful, though, church, that we make sure we understand what are the close-handed positions, meaning, hey, This is clearly what the word of God says, and I will not budge on this, because thus saith the Lord. And then we have to have other situations where it's more open-handed. They say, I have my convictions on this. However, you cannot, cannot, cannot conclude with absolute certainty. And this is where the church has gotten into problems, because those raised in certain traditions will say, hey, Here is how old the earth is, and if you do not hold to this, well then, now you don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And I said, that is very irresponsible to say, because the truth is, we do not know when the beginning was, well, for, uh, with the statement, in the beginning, 
So we're going to talk more about this next week in, in, uh, as we study the actual creation. But three conclusions from just Genesis 1-1. That's as far as we're going to get today. The first one is this. Everything we see had a beginning. Everything we see had a beginning. Just because you see something, it's just kind of like, okay, then you can deduce that because we're here, we had to come from somewhere. That is the cosmological argument. That's the cause and effect. We see the effect, there must be a cause. And so as we look at that, um, we want to make sure that you understand the Hebrew terminology. And so in your growth guides, you will see pages like this. It's too small probably to read up on the screen, but in your growth guide, we put terminology so you will be familiar with terminology that we'll be alluding to. And also we were daring enough even to put in this one. Here is young earth ideas. Here's old earth ideas. And so, with that, we are going to be opening up a can of worms based on some of the past in which you've been wearing the lenses of Scripture. But that's okay, because the Holy Spirit of God will reveal and convict accordingly. But here, um, again, we're reminded that everything we see has a beginning. But when did that beginning happen? Well, there's so many theories the, a popular one is called the gap theory, and it's the gap theory that would allude to an old earth. Okay, when we say old earth, we're talking an earth that might be 2 million years old, might be 10 million years old, okay? But here is why. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but then verse 2 says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Okay, so my question for you, I just want you to engage your brain a little bit. My question for you is when God creates, does God create chaos? I, I, know, I know some of you go, no, he doesn't create chaos, but here we have in verse 2 that there was, okay, God created the heavens and the earth, but now there was this, this chaotic um, place that was a tohu ruined and bohu vacant, and, and it was without form and void. Those theologians that would hold to something, there's many versions of what's called the gap theory. But these theologians would say this, that when we read in scriptures like Isaiah and Ezekiel, that is where we find out the behind the scenes in the heavenlies of the fall of Satan and the kicking out of a third of the angelic forces that tried to rebel against God. So gap theorists, many gap theorists would say that when Satan was cast out of heaven, it's as though God cast him to this place, earth, and in Satan's rule and reigned, nothing but chaos and darkness ensued. Okay? Now, I'm just saying gap theory. What can help reinforce this is what I love is the study of the linguistics and with time, the more ancient literature you find, the more you can, you can study it and draw accurate conclusions from it. One of those studies in the 20th century looked at that word uh, that was used for um, was, the earth was without form and void, and they say a literal, more accurate interpretation to that would be, and the earth became without form and void. Okay, now I just opened up a whole bunch of worms um, for some of your context. But again, I just want to say that when it comes to beginnings, when it comes to in the beginning, that the Bible was never designed to clearly say, here's when the beginning of the heavens and earth were made. We're going to talk about next week about the literal days of creation. And I, I will share again my views based on my studies rooted in Scripture. But here's why I say these things, that this has to be a place where people can have varying viewpoints. As long as the open-handed stuff 
is, is like, well, you know, that's not a salvation situation. That's an opinion situation. Because I know households who have varying opinions of these particular things. But they're still married. <laughs> and again, we can have varying opinions. I just want to make sure that as we study God's word, we just hold to what God's word is crystal clear on. We can hold and embrace that. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word for heavens is more the skies that we see, not the heavenly realm, but the skies that we see. And so God, Elohim, is the architect of creation. They would call that the teleological argument, meaning this. If you see the complexity of a a machinery or anything that has been created, the more complex it is, the more impressive it is of those who designed the complexity of that. Now, I know just looking at the human body and how the circulatory system works or, or, or how your body is able to fight off disease or how metabolism tragically slows with time. I hate that. Hate that. But it does. But you know, God created this amazing piece of machinery called your body. And, uh, and with that, you just know that this was an intelligent designer. And if you were to go to university, like I went to university and was taught, yeah, evolution is fact and all that kind of stuff. I remember meeting with my uh, professor one time and it's, it's almost like, so you're meaning to tell me that millions of years ago, there was a whole bunch of gas, and that gas exploded, and out came a piece of rubber. And that piece of rubber eventually, over millions of years, grew into a tire. But then that tire found itself amongst another bang, and now there's nuts and bolts that came resulting from that. And then there was something else that happened. There's another explosion, and out came a car. I go, man, that's amazing. And a car isn't sophisticated compared to a human body. And I go, and you mean like you really believe this stuff? I said this to a professor. I go, you really believe this stuff? I, I go, I think of myself as a person of faith, but I cannot have that much faith that you have to really believe that. Man, God created. This is why this is so important and so foundational, folks, that God, I mean, the scriptures start with God. God is the, is the architect. And lastly, God, Elohim, originally created something from nothing. Something from nothing. There's some different words for creation that we're going to investigate through this journey. But in Hebrews 11.3, it says this, By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. He's saying this, that God created something out of nothing. Can you explain that? I can't explain it. But we are going to see as we go through this incredible journey that God has a purpose. He's got a plan. He has put laws in order. When we as human beings or as created beings start saying, hey, I know better than God. Man, how many of us experience kind of what I experienced this morning? I was driving in this morning. It was snowing pretty hard. I had a long drive in and I was following after the the, you know, those are the cars before me, but I was having a mental time. I was just singing and praising God and my right tires end up going in the deeper stuff. And all of a sudden it felt a little bit weird because my tires went off from the spot that was cleared out. And I think for, uh, there's just so many in our world. And, and I, I think even within the church of Jesus Christ, that it's like, man, things feel out of alignment, out of kilter. I, I feel like I'm sliding, I'm out of control. I love that we have a loving God who says, hey, I am the creator, I am the designer, I have put things in order, and now it would do you well to fall in line with the order that I've put together. And I think that is the hope for this. 
Now, one of the tools that we are going to be uh, using here in the course of 2024 in three separate times is something called the Colossian Way. The Colossian Way class is going to cover three different subject matters in the course of the year. One is origins, the other is gender, and the other is politics. Oh, that's going to be fun. Yeah. Okay, why? What is the purpose of this class, this interactive time? Here's the purpose of it. We live in a day that when people disagree, they look at each other as enemies versus, hey, let's do the hard work of contending for unity. A year ago in 1 Corinthians, it says that we as a church are to contend for unity, which means we could have incredible diversity, and even in the midst of all that diversity, we can be unified. Why? Because who our eyes are are on, and that's Jesus Christ. And so with that, these classes are to help us be able to understand how we can have disagreement in certain areas and still be civil to each other. Man, go figure in today's day to be civil to one another who might have differing views. But I think for we to continue to be healthy as a church, we need these kinds of exercises. Also, throughout this series, I'm going to recommend different resources. Some have already been recommended in the the front of your growth guides, but throughout the series, we're going to turn you on to different books. I was so pleased how many, after first service, said, hey, I'm going to get that book. I'm going to start reading now. Uh, One of those books that, through this journey of my preparation, has been this one, The Unseen Realm. The Unseen Realm is just a fantastic book talking about subject matter that most churches will not address at all. But what I love about this, uh, this doctorate, he's a doctorate in Hebrew literature and ancient Semitic literature. And he, in his studies, he was like, why does the church never address this? This is definitely clear in the unseen realm, and the ancient literature reinforces it. But we discount it because of a Western mind. We discount it because the Enlightenment has kind of prompted us to say, well, if it's not explainable, I'm not going to believe it. But when I have some of my seminary professors recommend a book and say, man, this guy, his linguistics is right on, then I'm going to have to say, okay, he is introducing something that I have never read, never heard about, but even how I'm reading scripture is a little bit different because I've read and understand better from the original text what it means for uh, the look of the unseen realm and how you and I interact and fit with the unseen realm. It's mysterious, right? But it's good. That doesn't mean we should shy away from it. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to encourage us right now to prepare our hearts for communion. Prepare our hearts for communion. But before we do that, and before we're led by one of our elders, Scott McLuhan, um, I want to take you in Acts chapter 4, verse 24. Let me tell you the context of that story. Peter and John were threatened by the religious leaders because they could not stop talking about Jesus who had died and been resurrected and why he died and resurrected to atone for our sins. And the religious leaders were saying, you guys got to shut up about this name Jesus. And they said, no, we cannot shut up about him. Can't do it. And then Peter and John reported this to the church, and the church were praying. The church was praying for boldness, but here is how their prayer opened. Sovereign Lord, who did what? Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. That was the introduction to the prayer for boldness. Why would that introduction help me pray for boldness, help you pray for boldness? Because it's the reminder that God is the God who made the heavens and earth. And if he could do that and make the beauty of the, um, just the magnificence of even the human body, if he could do that, what might he be able to do in and through the situation you find yourself in? It should give you hope. It should give you confidence. And so with that, I am just going to, um, I'm going to invite you just to take some quiet time right now. And pray, Lord, how 
might I need to finish this prayer for 2024? And it might be, Lord, maker of heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Lord, help this year. Help, help me dot, dot, dot. Or help me uh, have the ability to see you in a way I haven't seen you before. Whatever it might be, I want you to do the hard work, and, but the very important work right now of praying that prayer before we go into a time of communion. Can you do that, church? Let's do that together. Pastor Brian, earlier in the message, uh, put these words on the screen. He said, Genesis describes what is broken in the world, how it got broken and stays broken, and God's plan to redeem the chaos. And in, a, in an essence, that, that is the gospel. That God, the creator of the universe, creator of you and me, um, wanted us to be created to have a relationship with him. And that our sin caused that separation in that relationship. And it was why Jesus had to come to do what Jesus did on the cross. And it leads us to this place of the communion table. And I'm going to invite our servers to come down and begin to pass out the elements But I want to I want to invite us this morning to to the communion table, which at Grace Spring, if you are new here um, or if you're a, a guest, we we welcome all believers to take part in in communion. You don't have to be a member at Grace Spring, but we do ask that you're a member of the body of Christ through faith. Communion, to me, has has always been a sacred space. It's much more than a quick part of a worship service. To me, communion always brings with it two really strong emotions, and I'm going to share those with you. Those two emotions actually are, are very different emotions. The first emotion that that I always encounter when I come to the communion table is one of heaviness. Where, man, I feel the weight of Jesus' sacrifice on my behalf. That I recognize the sin in my life. All that he had to go through to atone for that. I walk myself mentally through that trial that he endured, through the abuse, the shame, people sp spitting on him, hitting him, the, the crown of thorns that he wore man, on my behalf, the, the flogging that he endured, the crucifixion. And Man, I feel the weight of that. And so there's a time of confession always for me. And then that other 
emotion that comes at the table comes out of uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. It says, as long as you take the bread and partake in the cup, you proclaim my death. And well, he said, you proclaim his death until he returns. And so when we take part in communion, we proclaim his death. We also are pro proclaiming that he had victory over the grave, that he rose up that he died for the reason of giving you and I new life, this restored relationship with God. As we enter into Genesis, the, the, the foundation of our faith, we recognize that, you know, Psalm says that God knew every one of your days before one of them came to be. He knew that you were gonna need a savior. He knew that I was gonna need a savior. And so since the foundation of the world, he knew the plan. And so we take great joy, the other emotion at the table. Uh, communion in Greek is Eucharist. That word means thanksgiving. We rejoice and find great joy in the fact that he died for our sins and has given us new life, victory over the grave. Amen? Amen. And so I want to I invite, I'm going to give you another few minutes in solitude and quiet to walk th through those two emotions with your Savior, the confession, the feeling, the, the, the gravity of, of what he did for you, and then the joy that comes from receiving the forgiveness that he offers. So I'm going to give you some time with just, just you and the Lord. So on the night that Jesus would be betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you, the blood of the new covenant, take and drink. Would you pray with me? Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our King, we thank you for what you did in coming to restore order to this world, to restore our relationship with the Father. We have hearts full of joy and gratitude this morning as we recognize our deep need for you each day and the fact that you have welcomed us through your blood, through your broken blood, body, back to the family of God. So we pray that you'd receive our, our offering of worship as we begin to sing again and know our hearts are full of thankfulness and it's in your name we pray.
My. 
church family. Uh, so important, I think, for us always to, when the Word of God is open, to be able to respond as an act of praise, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week. And uh, that's why we always put this slide up that says offering, offering our, our Lord the first fruits of our time, our talent, our treasure in such a variety of ways. And I pray as you go into 2024 that you're prayerfully seeking the Lord to be very intentional in those things. I know in December we didn't talk a lot about offerings because we had had some big asks and this church responded in amazing ways, but we got a little bit behind budget at the end of the year, but that's okay. Um, we have uh, six more months just to be able to continue on and uh, continue with the ministries here. But also, I wanted to alert your attention to something, too, which I think is so uh, fun. How many of you love to laugh? Any, anyone love to laugh? I think laughter is just great. Others like, I hate laughing. Um, we have an opportunity. Michael Jr. is coming a week from Thursday night here. Uh, Alternatives is one of our ministry partners, and they just amazing job contending for life. And they have their fundraising event here held at Gray Spring. But for our church family, they've given a special deal. If you want to do a date night where it's called the BOGO deal, but if you go on to the Alternatives and you purchase your tickets, um, I believe there's a code there that if you did an all caps BOGO laugh, in all caps, you got to know how to spell uh, BOGO laugh, B-O-G-O-L-A-U-G-H, just if you didn't know how to spell that. But if you put that in, you can get your second uh, ticket for half off. And again, because it's a fundraising event, um, I believe it's $50 a ticket, but uh, Michael Jr. is a great comedian, and it would just be fun just for our community to pack this place out um, a week from Thursday night, really being the uh, Thursday night, the 18th. So anyway, with that, um, man, God is doing some good things, and Man, I pray that you will get into the Word this week. Study Genesis 1 as we press into that next week. Lord God, as we head out to the mission field you've called us to, Lord, may we be faithful. And Lord, thank you that you are a God who created heaven and earth, and you are a God who did not just create it and let us be, but that you have chosen to be intimately involved in your creation. And we praise you for that. May we go in the strength and the encouragement and the hope that that provides. In your holy name, amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.